Today, I chose a subject uh, which is um, the hands, the Lord's hands or the hands of the Lord. And I'd like to first read Matthew 14, starting from verse 12. Matthew 14, starting from verse 12. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it. That was John the Baptist's body. And took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great, a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitudes send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they ate and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that have, had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. And straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. It's very important uh, while we are taking this part to look what happened before that event and after. This is very important in my opinion. The reason is that uh, this uh, this miracle was recorded in the four gospels. So here we have to pay attention. Before we read about the feeding of the multitudes, we see the Lord receiving the bad news of Herod beheading John the Baptist. Why did he behead him? He beheaded him because of and promise or an oath after a dance. What a trifle thing, what? But this is the world. John the Baptist, as we all know, had warned um, Herod. He told him, it's not lawful for you to take the wife of your brother while he is still alive. He did not like this. And of course she hated that. And when her daughter, had pleased him in most probably in a very, um, uh, very bad way in dancing. So he gave a word and he could not take it back. And even he regretted it, but still he beheaded John the Baptist. Once David made a mistake, and Nathan came and warned him. He told him, what you're doing is wrong. What you did is very wrong. But David succumbed. He listened and he repented. And this is the difference of when we see a, a person with a relationship with God, when he's warned, he would take a complete different um, um, attitude and reaction. John beheaded, this broke the Lord's heart. Yet this does not stop him 
from caring for the multitudes. And now before I go more than that, I uh, further, I would like to speak first about the position of the Lord, the position of the disciples, and then I would like to speak briefly about that boy before getting into the miracle itself. The Lord feels for our pain. We have to know that. He, he is sad and he's saddened when we are sad. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 63, verse 9, it's written, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Remember Lazarus. It's written that at the grave, although he knew that he will raise Lazarus from the dead, yet Jesus wept. He wept for many reasons, but mainly he wept because he saw people sad, crying, their heart chattered. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. What did he do? First of all, he healed their sick. He took, he, although he was very sad with the news, of course, what we would call today, his mood was very bad, yet he had, he was in bad mood, but yet he did not think of himself. He thought of the multitudes, the sick in the multitudes, and also he had compassion. Even while being accused by their leaders, by the multitude's leaders, to be working with the power of the devil and cast out devils. He was called Belzebub, and yet, yet this did not let him think about himself. Even after we see in chapter 13, Matthew, the previous verse, uh, uh, previous chapter, when he left the house. He had already closed that chapter. He went out of the house and went and stood by the sea. In uh, this was like uh, going, directing his uh, speech and parables to the to the world. He has given up on this generation, this evil generation, and being saddened by, by what happened to John. Yet he was still caring for and uh, the multitude and he was moved with compassion. The disciples was not very original. First thing they did was let them go. This was their solution. It's very bad. They had no uh, way to think. After seeing the blind being uh, regaining sight, and after seeing all those um, miracles that the Lord had made previously, yet they were, in my opinion, very callous. Let them go, just let them go. You know, this is dismissing them uh, would be the, the good solution of the problem. They saw the leper become whole. And this is something that never happened before. A leper would most probably die by leprosy, yet they still could not see beyond the day, the moment. Uh, now, we let's come to the boy. The boy, this mother who sent her son and prepared him. She prepared him first spiritually by making him go and listen to the Lord in an early age. We don't hear him being bored or restless. He was able to go and listen. He was with the multitude. Most probably he was, although there were 5,000 uh, men in addition to the children and the women, yet, most probably he was alone and he went to sit in the very first uh, rows to listen to the Lord. This must have been a great mother. 
a mother who prepared him and made him go there without any supervision. He was able to go and sit there and listen to the Lord. Most probably, he was the one who went to Philip and was ready to share his five loaves and the two fish. His mother also prepared for him for his materialistically. And this reminds us of the virtuous woman in Pro Proverbs 31. She takes care of her household, of all the needs, of all the needs of her household. But first comes the spiritual need. She had to address it. She had to bring it. And most probably she started at a very early age. Um, I uh, would like to um, remind us of the mother of Moses. She only had two years until he is weaned to teach him everything he needs to know about his position and the position of the people of God. Also in Timothy, 2 Timothy, first chapter, verse five, uh, the apostle Paul commended um, the mother and the grandmother of Timothy. When he said, when I call to remembers, when I call to remembrance, the unfeigned faith, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that it is in thee also. I believe that a mother and even here a grandmother can have a very um, lasting effect on, on her uh, offspring. She would, she would, raise children uh, that would be in the fear of the Lord and would be uh, loving to the Lord, respecting the Lord. And it has to start in a very early age. I uh, say, having said this, I have my face in the dust, knowing my short, my personal shortcomings as a father. Great men have most of the time godly mothers. The little that they know, the boy and his mother, that they would be partakers of this great miracle. And more than 2000 years later, we are speaking about them and commending, and we take them as a, a, a model of how we should act after all those years. Back to the miracle, the Lord will feed them all using five loaves and two fish. This is the way the Lord operates. He does not take a lot to accomplish great things. Remember when, the, when he took the Gideons, he said, this is too much. These are too many people. Now I, I have to um, filter them. I have to uh, divide them. I just need a few because that is the way the Lord, um, the, word, the Lord operates. Now, I would direct your attention to four verbs. And in my opinion, this, these verbs are the methodology that always govern God's operation. Any time God makes great things, he goes through those four verbs. He took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. Those are the four verbs that explain every single action that God would do, accomplishing uh, great things using uh, little things. First, he takes, he took the five, the five loaves and the two fish. He took them into his hand. He had to have 100% control over what he takes. 
it had to rest in his holy hands, in his blessed hands. So this is the first, we have to go to the Lord and surrender to him if we would ever be used. Unless we come to that point, it will never, the work of the Lord will never start. He has to take control. In Hebrews 11, 6, he says, he speaks about going to the Lord and surrendering to him. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Remember Rahab. Rahab, we spoke about her a few weeks ago. All she wanted was salvation. All she wanted was to be saved. She and all that are hers, her household, her family, her larger family. Little did she know. She did not know. She could have never imagined that just going to the Lord and giving him a control over her life would mean that she would marry Solomon and she would be, they would be very rich, materialistically speaking, and then they will have Boaz as son. And Boaz, who is a type of Christ, and we, when we read the book of Ruth, we know that Boaz was a wealthy and strong man. And later, to find out that she would be a great, great grandmother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Little did she know, but she had to go to the Lord and let him have control of his over her life. Many times we are reluctant and hesitant, giving God con full control of our lives. But I believe that it is impossible to please him, just like it says in the verse, the sixth verse of the 11th chapter. So the first verb is he took, the second one was he blessed. He gave thanks. And this is the only way to multiply. When we receive, we have to thank God listens. If we have a thankful heart, this opens the door of more blessing. If we, and the opposite of a thankful heart, in my opinion, is a murmuring heart, a complaining heart, always looking at what we do not have, what we desire, rather than what we have, and it is so much. So, blessed the Lord blessed those loaves and this and those fish, and then he broke. That's the third verse, that the first, the third verb that I would like to use. However, before I speak about that uh, verb, I would see, I would like to go back to the blessing. Remember how much God has uh, blessed uh, Jacob, remember. Jacob said in uh, chapter 32, verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed, un showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Two bands in our, uh, in the Arabic uh, language, it says two armies. That's how much, how many they were. This is the man who crossed the Jordan with one staff, with a staff, with a stick, and God has blessed him so much. So going back to broke, the Lord broke the loaves, broke the, the fish. This is the most treacherous process to the flesh 
And yet, in the same time, it is the most important process before being used. All those who were used by the Lord were broken. They had to be broken. When we say broken, we speak about self-esteem. We speak about natural affection. And one very important is self-will. Those things have to be broken throughout the Bible. All those who had a great uh, journey ahead of them, they had to be broken. And after being broken, remember the alabaster box. Only after the alabaster box was broken that the fragrance went and filled the whole house. Only after the alabaster box was broken. And it was a very expensive one. The lady, the, 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 the woman did not open it. She could have opened it from the lid, but she just broke it at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fragrance went out and everyone enjoyed it because it was broken. The last verse, the last verb is gave. So the first was took, second was blessed, third was broken, and the third and the, the last fourth is gave. In abundance, God, when he has those three verbs take place, consequently, he gives. And when he gives, he gives abundantly. He fed 5,000 men, 5,000 men, excluding women and children. And then there were 12 uh, big bags of fragments. It was so much. Everybody was filled. I'm sure they had a long day and they were very hungry. And after they were filled, materialistically speaking, and filled, spiritually speaking, just being, imagine being close to the Lord, looking at him, listening to him. After being fed in abundance, it was even more. Remember, when he let them sit, he told them, sit. Most probably they were standing in reverence, maybe. He said, don't just sit down, make groups, and eat. And he took care of him. I went back to the Lord's Supper. And I found that in the four, uh, in the three instances that were, it was mentioned in Matthew and Mark and Luke, the Lord went through the same four verbs. He took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it. So this is the same way he works. And the Holy Spirit, when... Um, Paul spoke about it in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and he had given thanks. He break and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is the same way even recorded those verbs, the same way the Lord, every time I will hear those words, every Lord's day, I will remember those four verbs. Uh, after Everybody ate, the Lord set them, the multitudes let them 
he let them go. And then he did something very peculiar. And straight away, verse 22, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. It's very important, as I said, when the Holy Spirit records two events before and after that miracle that was recorded in the four Gospels. The Lord made, made them enter. He constrained them. He pushed them to enter. And then when they went through the tempest, through the turbulent sea, again, the disciples had to fear, had to be, to be scared. After seeing the Lord's power over natural uh, constraints, they feared what is going on. The Lord led them through it, and then he came in the fourth watch. And straight away, Jesus spoke, spake unto them, saying, Be of good, good cheer, it's, it is I, be not afraid. When we look at the disciples, it's, it's very um, sad how they were uh, thinking in, a, in their limitations, the natural limitation, rather than the power of God. Yet, I feel that we are, in many ways, we are the same. So, once again, I'd like to uh, summarize what was said, Lord, thinking uh, about the multitudes caring for them, uh, watching over them, and at the same time, when he took in his hands the very little, he had control over it, he blessed he blessed it, and then it multiplied. He broke it. He broke it because this is the most important process in, in his um, activity. And the last, at last, he gave in abundance. I, you know that I do not like to go ever over 40 minutes. So today it's a bit short, but I would like to hear others maybe and let's all be partakers in that. May the Lord bless those uh, uh, few words for our edification.